Hello and welcome to KCP Community Meeting, November 16th, 2021. Uh, we have some items on the agenda uh, and I think we could have more also if uh, if anyone is interested and I think we can probably, there's actually uh, kind of a lot in both of these. Um, the first one, uh, we had a conversation, some of us uh, here had a conversation on Friday about um, how it could or how it should look to import and export APIs for a workspace to say, I would like this API, both the, the types and the controllers that uh, handle those types. I would like this version of this. Uh, and for API providers to say, I provide this API, these types in this implementation uh, and how the two should match up, uh, mash up to be able to uh, roll out upgrades of those across uh, workspaces. Um, is Andy, Andy, do you want to go into sort of a high level view of how that should look or what we're currently thinking or current stuff we're, you know, blocked on thinking about? Um, sure. So Stefan had put together some thinking of what uh, a data model could look like for uh, trying to, to make this happen. And um, I don't remember if we've shared that doc publicly yet or not, but um, if not, we'll make sure it's cleaned up and shared. Uh, but we were thinking about having uh, provisional names, of course, but a concept like an API export. And you would specify, um, actually, let me start. We'd probably start with something that's like an API resource schema that conceptually it's like a CRD, but there's no storage associated with it. There's no handling code associated with it. So it's really just a way to model an open, an open API schema as a standalone resource. And then you would have an API export resource that can point to one or more schemas. So imagine that you have something like cert manager, which has multiple resources and kinds that uh, are grouped together in an API group. So each one of those like certificate would have its own API resource schema, certificate signing request, issuer and so on would each have their own uh, API resource schema resources. And then to export them as a group, you could create a single API export uh, instance, and it would point to all of those schemas. And uh, on the flip side, you would have an API import or API binding resource, and that would allow a consumer to say, please bind or otherwise make available an exported schema or ex export you know, group of schemas into my workspace. And then we'd probably have one more concept, which um, we, we need some way for a client, whether that's somebody like Cube Control or a controller, to be able to ask for a view of all instances of a particular resource that match that exported schema. Um, and I realize this would probably be easier with a diagram or uh, the document, but I don't have that handy right now. Um, but imagine, for example, that two of us independently both want to export cert manager APIs to consumers. They may be identical, or maybe there's some slight variations, but as an operator, like I want to deploy a controller that can go look at certificate signing requests. I only want to see the ones that are for my schema that I'm exporting, that other people are importing and using in their workspaces. I don't want to see somebody else's um, bound and imported certificate signing requests because they weren't coming from my export. So even um, if the type is identical, even, even if the, the schema type is identical, is identical. yeah, yeah. Um, because it might not be in the future, right? Yeah. Um, Steve uh, said in the chat, notably right now, the import is for an export, not a schema. Yes. That is the owner of the export gets to choose which schemas are exposed, not the user, right? Yeah, and so the, the, the intent there is to allow the owner who's doing the export to give an export a name, like 
this is my cert manager export or my cert manager APIs. And the thinking is as a consumer, you're not necessarily saying I need a certificate signing request resource because that's too granular. What you're, it, I, I'd hesitate to make this um, parallel, but it's kind of like service catalog and like going shopping for services. It's like, I'm going shopping for APIs. I want something that gives me a whole suite of functionality related to certificate issuing and management. So but, I'm gonna I mean, that, that is what you're doing. I mean, you're making yeah. a decision to consume something, but most things aren't like, there's few things that are an API by itself, maybe like yes. half of them and the other half aren't. So you are it's, like shopping is a good analog for it. It's like you're going into the supermarket and you are going to specific places looking for specific types of functionality. In Cube, no one's ever really made that distinction because it was always one type of API or another type of API, right? Like secrets or NCD operator or Knative or you know Istio. Like they're all different things, but they're all just doing something on the cluster. A part of that's there, but like there could be wildly different types of APIs. And so because of that, like it's we're moving from like being a controller centric problem to an API centric problem, which does really change that dynamic, right? Yeah. I just wanted to enthuse about that for a second. Thank you, Clayton. <laughs> uh, so I think I actually, from, from hearing your uh, description, I think I'm actually going to correct the thing I said before, which is this is entirely schema centric and not controller implementation centric, like the the uh, controller implementation that is operating on these objects can change unbeknownst to either importer or exporter. This is just about saying, I have a new schema for a certificate signing request. Would you like it? Well, is the exporter one? would know because presumably they've got controllers running against it, but it would be unbeknownst to the importer. The, the right. name of the import basically is this unique thing which never changes. Implementation can change, right. schemas can change, but schemas, um, I mean, they have a life cycle, which sometimes you want to see, sometimes you don't. The import, it's, as, as Andy said, it doesn't specify the schema, but in the moment you bind, some controller will basically fix a schema, which is then represented in the status. And there's a lot of analogs here to like concepts that we came up in image streams, right? Like tags for image streams in Docker registries are a lot like the very, very, very few people know like anything really about like, so they're looking at like something like a name in a, in a Docker repository for like, I want Postgres latest. I want Postgres nine. I went Postgres 9.3.4. Almost no one ever asks for 9.3.4. They start from the like, I either want to grab Postgres or they go one step down, which is like, I want a, I want Postgres 9 or 9.1. I guess like Postgres, it's like going to be the, do the, is Postgres do minor? You can Postgres <laughs> minors are basically <laughs> majors. For the sake of argument, Postgres hates semantic versioning and it's okay. We understand that we all hate semantic versioning. Um, so like, you know, nine, three or whatever, I'm just making up numbers at this point. That's your, that's what you want to lock to. And you've made a contract, which is accepting nine, three is accepting that someone doesn't break you under the covers. Postgres verifies that the tag, the person publishing the tag verifies that. And then if someone changed nine, three out from underneath you to be nine, four, you would you have, have a very bad day. So I think like a bunch of the analogs there, we can draw. We should basically talk about like there's a good opportunity here andy to like talk about this like grand theory of versioning which we don't actually care what the versioning is but when you bind to an api you are accepting the the default assumption probably should be you expect not to get broken yeah i totally agree and um i've used as a parallel example um clients talking to any of the cloud apis google amazon azure and whatnot and so those are documented APIs. Uh, I know like in Amazon's case, they tend to be versioned by date. And if you are writing your own like super low level client, that's that should continue to work as long as you're using APIs that haven't been removed. 
and presumably they'd go through a deprecation period and you would have time to update your super low level client before that happens. Uh, the same thing would be true if you're using an SDK. So you've got the AWS SDK, it's a specific version that presumably is going to work against the set of APIs that it's coded for until some of them fall off. And if you want to take advantage of newer features, you just upgrade the SDK. And I, I think the same approach is something that we should strive for, uh, for both exporters and, and importers. So if you're exporting an API, you shouldn't break people and we should have guidelines for how to you know, do breaking changes. And then for importers, you should be confident that it'll continue to work until stuff is deprecated and removed. And and it's an important point to note, like when you invoke an API endpoint um, and it's not really a, uh, a, a durable post CRUD operation, like there's a very important nuance about REST, which is like Cube has really embraced the idea of durable objects, which is you post it and it's there for the long haul. When you go to it, I don't think like an AWS API, like even though they typically would never do this, like they've got that old schema version, that schema, this is what we are talking about with like um, uh, the Stripe equivalent APIs is like that schema version has a specific behavior and it doesn't change. They may have multiple different implementations of that under the covers, mappings, et cetera. Maybe they don't, but they've gone the extra step because Cube kind of tries to do like the simple thing that's like you create it and then you can just like, it'll keep staying there. The only changes you can make from the outside in Cube are, um, you can only make syntactic changes. You can't actually change that object because there's just one object. Whereas in something like an Amazon system, like they, they, they almost certainly have an internal representation of an EC2 instance that the surface thing is only a basic representation of, and there's no guarantee that you know, the create instance call in the future isn't gonna change defaults and behavior and all that. We're talking about a subset of that, but there is a question is, maybe we should spend a little bit of time as we go through this afterwards and create a, a special sub thing, which is for purely virtual resources or resources that may want that sort of thing, do all of the same assumptions hold that we're making around API binding, like schema compatibility, like we have not even really talked about this, but could you re register two objects that rep are represented by the same object somewhere else? Probably not in etcd or in our existing storage systems, but so like um, I'll put that as a, a note in one of the the docs. But that's a separate thing we can come back to. Stefan, you had your hand up for a while. Did you have a comment? No, it was just about the life cycle from a controller point of view of the schemas of consumers. This will be visible to some degree. Like the normal way is to implement a standard procedure, like a standard deployment of new schemas to all importing workspaces, maybe in a uh, rolling fashion, maybe with canary, maybe with uh, green or blue green deployments. But it's it's kind of visible, like the use as a developer of the controller has access to that data. And if something goes wrong, like somebody messed up with an API change, there will be ways fix that, like you can go workspace, uh, workspace by workspace and fix that in an automatic way, but it's 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 visible to a um, developer of, an, of a controller. Is it unreasonable, and Stefan, that was a good point too, because that actually prompted another question is, um, it would be useful to go look at um, other generic storage frameworks, like people who help you build schemas and then you know come up with a database representation, um, store that. And uh, there's like, you know, all the way from like, I I'm not talking as much about um, ORM frameworks as I am. Like there's a set of people out there that do, you can create your data model, like Firebase and all this, like create your data model, create your storage model, create your schema, create your rest schema. Here's your endpoints. Like that, those, how people think about those, looking for things about how people manage the change over those and what kinds of tools they expose to users would probably also be good as a, yeah. as a sub research sub bullet. Um, research how, um, I don't know, it's not declarative, like API builder systems work, like API management. Um, what does Google offer for API management? What does Firebase offer? What is um, some of these startups? I, I got a, I have a couple of small project things that I can send along. So I'll put that in one of the notes, I guess. That's a good point. Yeah. 
also for, for modeling, um, we should take a look at image streams, Andy. Maybe we find some good ideas which we can copy. Yeah, I, I can list out whatever the, the Ben and I had like a lot of long discussions on like, does the latest tag, what does the latest tag mean? Yeah. And we, we agreed on things like when you use the latest tag, you want, like when you create a copy of it, you actually want to take what the latest tag is pointing to. So the latest tag is kind of like the referential tag to a stream of consistent API. Steve, don't be a smart up. <laughs> My uh, my previous self is going to come back to haunt me, I guess, for creating those <laughs> image stream APIs mm -hmm. many, many years ago. That's right. Andy, I remember we were going through whole Brian's uh, keys and arrays versus uh, uh, maps versus arrays and public schemas versus uh, maps internally. Just so long as we don't have a latest. I think latest was a real mistake. Uh, well, it was, it was interesting because image stream specifically said latest was a mistake yeah. and tried to give an improvement. I think one of the things like with API binding would be, we should ask the question and OLM maybe has some data on this Helm people doing Helm charts is like, what is someone's expectation or even in a cloud? Like when you start writing a cloud formation, do you default when you write, start writing a Helm chart, do you assume snapshot? and then lock there, right? Like when you, or sorry, not Helm, uh, Terraform. Like when you when you create a Terraform file, it creates a lock file that is locking from quote unquote latest or latest stable to all of the versions. That was what, that's what I was meaning by the, what image stream tried to do, which is like you start with grab the snapshot and then that's your thing. If you grabbed Knative, you would obviously grab a snapshot. If you grab Tecton, you would grab a snapshot mm -hmm but then you would expect it to be supported. But then the next question would be like, is that actually, are there other choices? Like we talked about feature flags and feature gates and optional features and um, like, can you opt into behavior differences? Like, is there a config file for an API or is that what an API is? Um, like feature gates make sense in cube because we don't allow you to have multiple versions of the same API. This was like something that was like, I was just trying to wrap my head around even as we were talking about it, which would be, you may not need feature gates because you can just expose something with all of the gates on or a set of the gates on and be like, you want to try this? Here's this with this field. And it it's a it's a published version plus some optional changes that may not have a future. Not the graph stuff, but like the, you know, I can expose you any API I want. If I want to add a field that controls behavior, I just add it to the API. And then, you know, then there's the corresponding question, which would be, um, you know, is there a way to specify behavior in mass? And that's like the organizational scoping, right? Like would I expose an API to an organizational scope or to um, a smaller scope than all workspaces? Or would I just say like, I'm exposing an API to my org and only my org can see it. The act of exposing it to the org is how I make those decisions. I'm like, well, who's implementing it? There's an API and an implementer. And that's all I have to worry about. Um, Andy, uh, other... oh, go ahead, Jason. Sorry. Stefan's hand is still up. I'm not sure if that is intentional or Stefan. It's not. There it goes. Um, okay. <laughs> so I was going to try and find like a concrete. So uh, I don't know if we talked to anybody with like who we were kind of like going on our own experiences here. We've got a couple of them. When will y'all feel comfortable about? Um, I was going to line up at least, I was going to go look to line up at least one or two people to talk to who have an API evolution problem today. Um, I was going to go like find some uh, folks who've done this. Uh, we had the Jordan thing. I don't know, Andy, it did, um, I did not share your doc with Jordan. He said he was looking for his old stuff, but he'd be willing to comment on a, big, a, a list of API evolution problems that were more in the general cube sense. Um, but I was going to try and find one or two end user type people who are like, hey, I want to walk through exactly what API evolution looks as a team who has deployed an operator and have this problem. Um, has anybody had any of those discussions? Not yet. I, coming from a long time working on cluster API, I think that there's good uh, history there. Um, so I could reach out to some of those folks if we wanted. And I feel like we have some runway here. Like I wasn't thinking about this like, I, I think there's still value in mining our own experiences. Um, I was going to try and find I was going to try and craft concrete use cases that we're going to have to go solve into 
how would we approach getting someone who has familiarity with it being involved in defining it? And the, um, I started this evolution document. Maybe we can just share that, like 12 examples. And I'm pretty sure Jordan can add an, another five or so, maybe cluster API as well. Actually, uh, so I just thought, so that's, uh, so what you're saying, Stefan, is like, I probably, uh, the schema, the folks doing the Kafka schema registry, because um, we we're talking about like API management type solutions for the people doing API schema registry stuff, like for Kafka, that's pure schemas on data that you can't change, but there's rules around it, right? Like you can generate clients from it. There's a lot of similarities. It's not identical. And then Joaquin, maybe we want to talk about like, what are some examples from like the API management space? Um, so like those two could be the concrete ones that I could go suss out. Because the schema registry folks, you know, that's that's imposing a schema on messages being written onto a Kafka log. And there's a lot of analogs there that they may not have the whole experience, but they absolutely have to deal with evolution. Um, and we may be able to tease apart, like, what are the elements that are common from evolution? And then, you know, on the API management side, at least, um, Joaquin, we've got some experience on that, right? I would like to share one idea I had with Steve in a chat. We discussed how to make those schema changes and rejections of schemas and this whole graph idea visible to the user or to the, to the developer. And I think originally the idea was to make this kind of an implicit relation between schemas. It's defined by some logical rules, but it's not really visible. It's more like a theoretical concept. And the idea which we had was that we make it, that we make a parent or a successor relation visible, like an owner reference similar to that in schema. So a schema can point to its parent. And um, this forms a graph, obviously, and we can do validation. Like we can check when obvious changes are incompatible, like say, I mean, renaming a field, for example, it's not possible, shouldn't be possible. Those things we can detect and we can reject um, a schema change or schema creation. So there would be validation for the developer in building this graph. And um, we can we cannot see everything, but we can rule out a lot of schema changes, which we don't want. Well, and, and, yeah. and that leads to the, for the things that we can't rule out, is there an attribute that's similar to the parent relationship that allows you to flag this as incompatible that then can exactly. propagate? Like the source of truth is the schema where like someone's like, oh, no, 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 this one was bad and here's why. Or we can associate warnings with it or something like that. Or when we, when we see, for example, that the validation, the CL validation changes in a way we cannot detect, you must override this. You have, have to acknowledge this is something we cannot check. So you may check that, and then you can uh, then you can create a new schema or update the schema. And we have quite a lot of schema compatibility checking code that David contributed. A, exactly, a this relation is basically for that. Yeah. Yeah, it should be. It's pretty. It's pretty complete, actually. Uh, I'm not sure that we. Yeah, have it's, it's complete for the syntactic orders. changes, not yeah. for the semantic. Yeah. Right. But sometimes, like registering validation, you know it's safe because you can reason about the data in clusters of customers. Um, formally, it's not safe, but you can override yeah. this uh, this property. Yeah, uh, and I remember we, uh, talking about the cap to add CEL validation. I'm really excited about that, but I'm also worried about the, what that will do for schema compatibility checks because now you have this like whole language to validate things, and there's no way to tell whether. Yeah, but you don't have emission webhooks, so you've you stopped you've stopped hacking off your foot with a bloody hatchet, and instead you've moved on to like gently banging your finger against the desk with a hammer. Um, Unfortunately, so, I think we'll still have webhooks, and so we'll have both the hammer and the saw. Uh, Jordan, Jordan yeah. is uh, Jordan is actually in jury duty today, and we were chatting about like another API review thing before Code Freeze, and we were he was saying like he he thinks the CEL stuff like that's his like personal mission to get rid of webhooks, and we were like talking about the cynicism of all our your mistakes live forever. Um, it was interesting too because like the CEL stuff like uh, it's really just making the indeterminability of code more obvious we were going to have to deal with concrete built-in type validation changing on core objects in cube no matter what mm -hmm. and so we already had accepted so anything we do is just net better 
So it may just not be worth the cost or all that, but it's, it's a, it's a good angle of like, you have to accept that physical types on a cluster can change what be wrong. You also have to accept that something can sneak by. We start with those axioms. We're better off because we're saying we're going to design for humans get things wrong. How do they get out of those scenarios? And so that's like the, um, a cube object when it's broken usually lets you mutate it to get back to working. Um, without necessarily saying you can go, you know, you could do it through apply or whatever, but you don't necessarily have to go and redo everything in your entire environment to get back to it. What is the analog for API? When would you need to work out of a bad state for an API? And it's going to be you know, some percentage of the time because we're human and we make mistakes. Yeah. Um, and the CL side too. So one note, um, and this is like Stefan, like your virtual workspaces stuff triggered this, um, which was like, I was kind of going through like what it would take to define a transformation such that you could actually do most, like we were saying, like you know, work virtual workspaces are examples of things that could be in code. There are relationships where it's like, is CEL or something like that actually complete enough that you could actually define a transformation on their underlying types or program it, you might be able to, I'm not sure it's worth it, but like, that would be a, that was an example that I hadn't thought of. And you were prompting it when you were talking about defining virtual workspaces on the fly, even if a lot of them are done in code, there might actually be scenarios where we're like, oh, this is just a, like an aggregated API server is hard to implement in code or it is, uh, it's hard to implement in something like CEL but you could conceivably source another thing and then do a transform on it, which for a lot of virtual resources that are in the wild today and for virtual sub resources are similar. So like there was a good like thread that uh, I wanna tie back to um, as we get more familiar with CEL type problems and CEL type trade-offs. Stefan, um, is there any migration stuff that, like we talk about like, um, if you needed to go fix something, would CAL be enough to do a fix and distribute it to yeah, as, all the- Yeah, so I, I haven't discussed this in detail with Joe and, and Jordan, but conversion is a thing you want to express for sure. And this is kind of a conversion which doesn't hold trip. I, I, yeah, I think you could, I think you could, yeah, it is a subset of the conversion problem. Um, maybe there'd be a, do you need external data in some cases, like conversion by definition yeah, today they, forces you not to limit. do that. So you can never do cross resource logic for that you need code. But if it's really just uh, been used of this, for this object, which you have in front of you and you have to, you can write a functional program, you basically can do that. It has some limits, like recursive data structures cannot be expressed, but this is not the normal case. Like you, can, you cannot convert a label selector from string to the uh, to the tree and back. This doesn't work. Yeah, I think I think CEL is going to CEL is going to be very nice for a lot of things, but I, I still don't think it will get rid of webhooks, unfortunately. Just for the the long tail of really 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 complex. Validations. But we might get rid of webhooks in KCP and say, if you want a webhook, you gotta go put it on a cluster. So we should, we should ask, that should be like a, let's, uh, let's put that in the list of debates to have with ourselves, which is, are webhooks truly required for the problems we are solving? And when we see one, we're like, is this a, is, does this require a webhook? Because previously we didn't design a lot of core cube resources with webhooks in mind. Um, mm -hmm. And so the answer for all the cube resources is, we didn't want a webhook, when we designed them, we put webhooks into CRDs because it was the, like CRDs and webhooks was like the example of like, well, we need something for admission. We know that CRDs are coming with, well, third-party resources at the time. And we'll just need something to deal with it. What tool could we use? But let's, maybe we should tee that up for a, uh, ask the opposite. Can we make a hard line against webhooks deliberately in our design? And what are the trade-offs? Uh, when you say webhooks would need to run on the physical cluster, that's effective. That's sort of like how we're talking about controllers running on the physical cluster, pointing back to KCP. We would just have each no. I I of the literally webhook. mean like if you want a webhook, you put it on the the low level type that shows up on a cluster, 
And then we would have to ask the question, is there a problem that we cannot solve without webhooks? And like, we have a couple from like CRDs already, like, um, you know, you could argue sub resources and admission, but it'd be like, well, maybe we don't want those. Maybe there's a better way to do that. Like, um, and I, again, like, I don't want to yeah. upset too many Apple cards, but it's, uh, it's not axiomatic that webhooks are necessary. Okay. I mean, yeah, it would definitely be nice not to have to deal with them. Um, nobody likes webhooks. Um, great. Um, Sorry, uh, I'm just catching up on the chat. Steve says, why does putting the webhook-based CRD on the P cluster help if we are going to have to bubble it up anyway for people to use it? No, no, no. Uh, the webhook is part of a problem with it's part of the P cluster infrastructure or the P cluster APIs. If you need a webhook, could you make an argument that if you need a webhook at the control plane level, you're solving it wrong? I don't know. I mean, we may, we may come back and be like, no, we'd like webhooks. Um, the, so the thing about a webhook on a physical cluster is a webhook on a physical cluster typically is self-referential and can bring down the cluster. That is the biggest part of the foot gun, which is it's not actually reliable to run a webhook. A webhook is- I just meant from the perspective of like aggregating the type or doing anything sensible with it. Or like the other part of webhooks is that they're black boxes. Yeah, yeah, like uh, black boxing is useful. I was talking about that side of it. I was the- okay. Like having cut arbitrary validation, we're going to have arbitrary code. And, you know, maybe there's use cases for that. Um, if you need webhook behavior on like a massive scale, so like a problem with webhooks is a webhook that's dealing at the control plane level has to be making like consistent list watch calls and doing all of that stuff. And they have, they're coupling, a webhook couples a failure domain of, being able to change something. So like a webhook is a, a line, a, de a dependency graph line in all the coupled failures. On a cluster, when you have a self-hosted cluster, it gets even worse. Um, and so like, you know, you cut the webhook and then suddenly the whole cluster goes down. That's like the most common webhook failure that anybody's described because they put it on a pod because of course everybody wants a webhook on pods. We have a bunch of mitigations for that. For the control plane, putting a webhook on a control plane should not bring down the control plane. Putting a webhook on a physical cluster should only have an impact on that physical cluster. So it might be, as we talk through it, that we're like, oh, webhooks don't cost us much on a logical cluster because they're so narrow in scope. But maybe there's like something like, oh, well, that actually is better then because they're just, we've completely separated the failure domain and we would just have to make sure to web run those webhooks in some place that is, like you're still coupling to the failure domain of the webhook. But maybe you could say, oh, well, then that's just a sharding problem, which is it's very easy to break up, just like we can break up a controller, just like we could break up um, parts of an API. We could also break up the webhooks. Maybe that takes 90% of the problem. Like we've modeled failure with webhooks, and then we, we're like, yep, we have a good solution for it. We don't have to worry about it. Does that make sense? I think so. Um, let's, uh, let's go into the KCP work packages doc, which, uh, uh, is effectively stuff we need to do for prototype two and other stuff, uh, on other timelines beyond that. Um, Andy, you are listed first. And so I'll ask you, is this, uh, is there anything else to add to, excuse me, to, um, this section? Or uh, well, I'll, I'll start by saying that this is definitely a living document. And um, Stefan and I were just brainstorming this morning uh, before this meeting with fleshing out some additional things in here. I think all or the majority of what's in here probably needs to get translated into GitHub issues that folks can go see more information about and potentially work on if they're interested. Um, I'm happy to go through things line by line here if that's a good use of our time. I'm also happy to not <laughs> and um, let folks look at this on their own time and um, add comments and questions as needed. So I'll sort of turn it back to the group and you all can Tell me what you would prefer. I don't uh, personally. I don't think we need to go through them line by line. I think the interesting parts are 
where there are dependencies between these. These are like roughly divided work streams of, of chunks of code or chunks of work to do. Uh, the interesting part to me is more where there are dependencies or where there are overlaps or where there are things like that. Like the sinker, the namespace scheduler needs to become multi multi logical cluster aware. That is a dependency that that chunk of work has on that chunk of work. That's all. And even like workspace size capacity, uh, uh, how that is configured doesn't really matter to the sinker, but the sinker needs to be able to enforce that in some way or the sinker or some system related to the sinker needs to be able to ensure that things don't go over their uh, allotted capacity. Uh, those are the interesting parts to me. Otherwise, uh, it's just a list of stuff for me to go you know, do, but where it overlaps and stuff is interesting. Are there other I areas would, where people see overlaps between sections? I would like to add one distinction we made. We made those or put the, those bold um, terms in front, prototyping, and there at the bottom or in the, in the second part, medium term. Um, there are some which are more like upstream refactorings, prefactorings, like things which we, we know we have to do and we have to start now because it just takes months to get some upstream. And they will help us considerably in the future. Like uh, when we come to prototype three or something and we want to build certain things, we better have those in upstream. So there are different kinds of uh, categories of work for yeah, different interests, different characters of people. So we have people who like to work upstream, who like refactorings. Um, there are there is work. It doesn't have to be this prototyping um, hacky kind of work style. There's other work as well. Yeah, I agree. That's also interest. That's an interesting overlap between our work and upstream, which has the confounding factor of impedance mismatches. Like, like code will be much faster to write in our land and much fast or much slower to write in upstream. Um, yeah, thank you for calling that out. Are there is any is anybody seeing anything calling out to them? Uh, you know, like a siren song. I'd love to go work on this, or uh, or the opposite. Terrible. Uh, what's a a gorgon or something, something you don't want to look at. Um, I'm hearing crickets. <laughs> I mean, certainly I would say, um, I, I Stefan, I don't know what your take on this is, but like nobody likes the master package and it's like a very like painstaking, like teasing it apart, but like, it's just like horrifically coupled. How much friction there like that one seems like a one that's like teasing parts well the control plane package now um teasing that apart like so that more of that stuff is available if you want it in extensions api server or in another staging like that's one that's like that sits at the root of being able to build minimal api servers and that one also has the clearest benefit for someone building api servers like cube um that was the one that i had thought of when yeah they're the second one here in the list yeah and um, I think there's also value in upstream if you don't consider KCP or anything similar. Like we know this is technical depth and I think nobody will object if we clean that. And I had taken a stab, for instance, at like moving all the internal APIs into their own staging repo. And then like, you know, that that's something that was like, that was too hard to do a year ago. Um, it's crept back in. Like we should probably look for places where we view that we're backsliding on long-term objectives. Yeah. Like so code separation and be like, hey, the code separation needs stuff. We're backsliding. Is there a way that we can use that refactor to accomplish a? In absolute, we have some tooling to restrict imports and we can restrict who can use certain packages. So we can define rules so that upstream, even if this is a multi-month process that this is usually the problem, like fixing this in one PR is easy, but you don't get it merged because it takes weeks to prepare. So we have to find strategies to do those moves um, in small pieces, but make sure that nobody behind you just destroys uh, what you just have done. So and there are ways to do that. So, yeah. And yeah. speaking okay. of the, the import rules, we've definitely broken them with the prototype code. So. Uh, I ran into that yesterday when I was trying to bump Django in our fork of Kubernetes. Um, so we'll have to do some 
untangling of the broken imports as well. Is the short term fix for that to just loosen the restriction on, on those imports or is that something that it's easier to actually? No, I think um, we're basic for the time being, I, I think it's easier to say we can have the, the import violations, but if we need to bump any dependencies in Kubernetes, like we just can't until we undo the hacks and turn them into real things. Yeah, I mean, we're all playing, everybody upstream is playing chicken with splitting up KK any further, but like it, it's there's just a bunch of ugly coupling there. So like uh, that would be another group that um, code organization or whatever is like, Kubelet, Kubelet going into staging is like a super obvious one. Internal API is going to staging has been one of my hobby horses, but I haven't gotten past that. Um, I mean, which one, we, which one going into staging? Sorry, I missed it. I missed Kubelet, one going, Kubelet going into staging uh, is a big one because that one keeps backsliding because Kubelet, it does not get to use internal APIs and people keep adding internal APIs to Kubelet. So. Um, are there any of these upstream refactors that are completely unblocked? Like these are all completely unblocked things for anybody that wants to go tilt at the window? Or They're not really spec'd out. I think yeah. um, Stefan certainly can provide insight. David, when he's back, um, with my recent explorations into the uh, workspace inheritance hack, like I, I'm starting to learn how discovery is set up for slash APIs at the root level as well as CRDs, and so um, some of the in some of the stuff in there around um, untangling aggregation and the API extensions API server. Um, like I've got some of that information in my head as well, but it's the sort of thing that I think is going to require a lot of discussion and planning and just brainstorming. Yeah, but the TLDR I think is cube aggregator is nothing we want. API services, they don't play a role here. If we want something like aggregation, this is more like on the virtual workspace level, maybe a completely different way to implement it. So we want to get that out. This makes our control plane much easier. Yeah, I mean, I think we could re-implement discovery without API services just based yes. on CRDs. So if, if you have somebody somebody on the call or somebody in your team who wants to participate, I think we can give pointers. There are many of those topics. There's one as well about resource versions. So people who like controllers, uh, Steve investigated which controllers use uh, resource version ordering. You might yeah, want that, to that, that one just those. seems blocked because like there's this really obvious use case for managing a local in memory cache and there's a bunch of controllers in cube that do it and so I, I like the idea of a cap to optionally garble your rv but as soon as you do that you're going to break your cube so like um, using it to figure out what other clients are using or parsing rv is like not i don't think that would be you, super useful did you get any insight in whether generation works in a couple or most of them <laughs> Um, potentially, yeah. I think the the key was when they were using RV to infer before and after relationships between two different types. Yeah. Secret and service account, for instance. Please show me this secret after at a state that is at least as new as this update I did to this secret. I think, but in any case, I guess like, yeah, I don't know. Would it be, yeah, we could go and at least try to fix all the other ones with generation. Um, generation, ooh, okay. Uh, and those were all ones that were fixable by spec generation and metadata. They didn't realize oh, that as, so. I mean, just having an example of something relying on generation 
for a classic problem and being able to say like, if your problem is this, you should use generation would be awesome since generation is supposed to work everywhere and has to work everywhere. Yeah, we, had, for... we had an example of storage, I think, say up, the, I mean, API calls for storage are expensive, so they avoid them. And when they update the status, they basically block the informer, they ignore events until the known update is visible to yeah. avoid additional calls. In which which with generation is like what generation is for. Yeah. Um, I Daniel didn't really like status generation, but like I think I can still win the status generation argument eventually, but I got to go prove to him that his baby isn't ugly by using, uh, by trying the um, server side apply for kubelet. Um, the, was there any case, Steve, where status generation was, or uh, something that covered status generation that was was necessary today? Do you know off the top of your head? I don't think so. Yeah. And the informer code, like, like I think some places used parse resource versions just because they're easy, not because they needed them. Yeah. So I don't know. I guess we, we could we could restrict imports on parse resource version. I mean, it's, yeah. it's parse it's, it's the standard lib. What? <laughs> But I mean, again, then a reviewer can be like, hey, you're doing this. I, I, it's really a question of like, is that the most effective use of the time to get to the outcome we want, which is. Yeah, I guess I was just saying like the tale here is like we'd have to update all those controllers. And then. Then land the cap and only then could people. I, I mean, it, it could be done in parallel, but like yeah. that cap means nothing until cube yeah. itself does not break. Right. We could. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we could certainly start that now. I think it's a compelling motivation for the cap to say, look at all the, it, it is really easy to mess this up. Look at how many times Kubernetes messed, messed up. this up itself. Uh, yeah. And this is the way to fix them. And even, even the cap. So like I have been using caps recently to encode historical domain knowledge about what the intent with cube was. It's a good opportunity to go back through and be like, we didn't intend this. We learned a bunch. Now that we've learned a bunch, here's what, Let's let's put up a set of principles that guide us going forward, not the idealistic version that Tim or Clayton or somebody who's like an old timer uses. Here's what someone can reference. Like I did that for the um, when we put in the metrics for scheduling, I went and like defined the resource model in a cap, and uh, you know scheduling sig signed off and node sig signed off, so we can at least be like, hey, if you want what we currently say is, we need to do that for like pod safety and a couple of other things too. So. Um, so it seems like we have successfully volunteered Steve to do the upstream uh, uh, RV opaquifying, opaquination. Um, are there uh, any others we want to talk about? These, I mean, this is a living document. We should add more context to these as we go. But um, um, or did, did we want to quickly talk yeah. about your your? Uh sequencing question about this short term like uh, so in in terms of um listeners and informers being logical cluster aware uh right now if you use the right client for your lister and your informer and you're careful about how you access the lister with the key mm -hmm. from your queue you're fine <laughs> like it's it's done it works. Uh, uh, then I'm completely happy. First of all, I'm completely happy to have the namespace scheduler not be multi logical cluster aware immediately anyway, because uh, we can demo useful things with one workspace being scheduled. Um, if what you're describing already works and just needs to be held carefully, I just need an example or hand holding. Yeah. Time. And I think when I, when I push the, and then I can do it. So, yeah. When I push the workspace <laughs> controller pair, you'll see that. Um, what was the other thing that you wanted? The other the other overlap was here that you were worried about. Uh, not necessarily worried about. Just need to be aware of the um, if a, oh, the size the size yeah the the capacity of a workspace or the uh, I don't really care how it's expressed uh, to users or how it even looks to the sinker, but the sinker will be responsible for enforcing that in some way, and so we just need to. Or the scheduler will, whether it's a, if, if, uh, 
workspaces are never allowed to have more than 10 CPUs, then the scheduler needs to enforce that. And if its workspaces are never allowed to have more than 10 CPUs per physical cluster, then the syncer needs to enforce that. Yeah, or I think right now of our the types... that the scheduler needs to. Sorry, our types don't even have capacity on the workspace. Sure, <laughs> sure, sure, yeah. A... I just mean when, uh, however that is designed, it will be syncer responsible for enforcing it. And I want to make sure that we don't. OK. Uh, design something that the syncer can enforce or have the syncer I guess I just more I, I, yeah I, I think because that doesn't exist yet at all um it's not an immediate be. blocker it's not like yeah it's not like I'm uh uh blocked on writing code because this doesn't exist I'm blocked on writing code cool. for a hundred other things so um yeah so it sounds like we're mostly all of us are out of each other's hair here for the short term which is good yeah, I think so. When when uh, the namespace scheduler needs to become multi -clus multi logical cluster aware, I will ping you for handholding about how to cool. use it correctly. But um, yeah, um, we have a few minutes left. If anybody else has anything else they want to discuss, show off ideas they've had. Otherwise, I'm also completely happy to give everybody six minutes back. All right. Threat realized. Everybody I, have a good week. Oh, no. Clear. I was just going to say, it, it's the the explosion of documents and people chasing stuff and coming up with scenarios is awesome. We just need to make sure that as we're doing it, that we keep building the interconnections between stuff so that like uh, someone can follow what we're doing. So it's good. Like we should, we should basically, uh, at some point soon encode whatever our what our agreed pattern is for communicating this stuff into something that goes into a repo which is like here's how we communicate about design stuff we started with investigations we started getting into google docs shared with kcp dev um we've got like some of the uh, what i would call like the adr style docs which aren't really adrs in a community sense um they're more adrs in like a folks executing on this like internally in one set of teams so we probably need to think about that but like this is really good so I congratulate us in the in pedestal in the back. Nice work, everyone. Please apply one backpack. Uh, all right. Uh, great. Um, have a great day, and we'll see you next week. Bye, everyone. See you.